This video is brought to you by my patrons and my new series, Unrated, only on Nebula. Stick around to the end of the video to find out more. The rain? Is that gonna ruin? Okay. Alright. Right. <clears throat> Action. It had been 16 years since... Uh, <clears throat> it had been 16 years since Todd Field... <laughs> Todd Field. Todd Field. <clears throat> it had been 16 years since Todd Field had directed a picture. And that film was Little Children, released in 2006 to critical acclaim. Enough acclaim that when I was in high school, I hosted a double feature and I chose Little Children and The Reader. And I was not allowed to choose the double feature ever again. The film is told from several points of view, including that of a omniscient narrator. But what stands out to me about this film years later, beyond the incredible performances and its central discussion of how to fairly balance empathy and justice, is how closely Little Children sticks to its theme. The main characters tease each other. They tear each other down. They bully, they hurt one another, they act out. They are desperate to fit in and desperate for the same things that they wanted when they were in grade school. All of these adults act like little children. And in Tar, Todd Field also crafted a film that stays loyal to its central theme. The story of Tar is pretty straightforward. A conductor with a sketchy past of problematic views and dating students is hoisted by her own petard, eventually ending in disgrace and obscurity. But just like little children, there is one central theme that runs through the entire two hours and 38 minutes of this film. It's the one thing that powerful people try to control, but have yet to fully conquer. Time. Spoilers for Tar, but I don't really think this is the type of movie you can spoil, so. After a brief text message exchange that subtly introduces the affair between Tar and her current assistant, the film begins with the credits. Todd has said in an interview that on streaming services, audiences often skip over them, so he put them in the beginning. We're asked to give due time to those whose labor went into the film. They deserve our time. As does the song in the background, which is sung by the Shibibo Kanibo tribe that Lydia Tarr studied with. Before we spend three hours with a rich white lady, let's give a moment to the culture that she appropriated. And while we wait with those who brought Tarr to life, we're transported to waiting with Tarr herself, behind stage, as we watch bits of the work that went into preparing her for this onstage interview. Much like the credits that just swam by, telling us who we should give credit to for Tar the film. The beginning of the movie takes us through those behind the scenes who are responsible for Tar the character. The stack of records she looks at to think of an outfit. The tailor who made it. Even her assistant, mouthing the glowing words she wrote for the interviewer to say. Tar has a particular affinity for Mahler. As much as this film is constructed, so is the persona of Lydia Tar. The editor edits the takes, the tailor edits her suits. While this interview may seem casual, so much time has gone into preparing for every last moment to make sure that it feels natural. Off the cuff, by showing us these moments of preparation, Todd is showing us how constructed these moments are. Much like in the beginning of the credit sequence, we hear Tar tell the Shibibo Kanibo singers, just, just ignore the microphone. Yeah, just, just, just act as if it's not there. Sing as if it's not there. When we watch a movie, we're supposed to just pretend that these moments of production aren't there. That there's no director standing just off camera. That there's no script or reshoots. I mean, look at the reverse shots on the students. There's no way that was done in real time. It's a hatchet job. By the way, I knew this film was going to be a horror movie when the entire audience politely chuckled at the mere mention of Mel Brooks right on cue. An extremely short and shimmering list that includes Richard Rogers, Audrey Hepburn, Andrew Lloyd Webber, and of course, Mel Brooks. <laughs> Ooh, terrifying. And now, Tar's time has come. If you're here, then you already know who she is. And that is one of the most important musical figures of our time. Todd Field was first an actor, and I think you can see this in his work. I just played the piano. It's very performance forward, character driven. 
He wrote the screenplay for Cate Blanchett after he changed Tar to a woman. When Todd was thinking about it, Tar was originally a male. Oh, man. In acting, if you want to sound a little pretentious, you can call your body an instrument. And in Tar, Cate Blanchett's performance, specifically her body language, is stunning. And illustrates to us just how constructed Lydia Tar's persona is. Tar is a great man of our time. And our time is currently one where we're reassessing great men and the harm that they've done to others in order to secure that title. The first real scene of the film is deceptively simple because it is just two people talking on a stage. But almost every phrase, gesture, and thought that's introduced here becomes important later in the movie. Like the first movement of a symphony, it introduces motifs that help us understand the rest of the piece. So we're gonna take a look at this scene and how Lydia Tarr conducts this interview. Time, 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 time. As we see Tarr sitting on the stage, we're placed in a very particular time, the now. Due to the pandemic, that performance, which was scheduled for last year, had to be canceled. But I'm told that next month, she'll make a live recording of Mahler's fifth. Never mind that the pandemic isn't really over. But as the interviewer continues, he organizes his questions around the calendar. Mahler's fifth, which will complete the cycle and will be issued in a box set by Deutsche Grammophon just in time for Mahler's birthday. What better time to plan the release of a box set? Happy birthday, Mahler. Tar on Tar will be published by Nantalisa's imprint at Doubleday just in time for Christmas. What better time to plan the release of a book? Happy birthday, Jesus. Tar starts off the interview by identifying her problem with the time that we live in. I mean, our era is one of specialists, and if you're trying to do more than one thing, it, you know, it's often frowned upon. She's complaining that people are prejudiced against her because she's such a Renaissance man. Renaissance man. And let me just say, as I multi-hyphen it myself, I happen to disagree. I think this is a time where you have to be 500 things just to make it all work. But she's also saying that people must not like her because she's just too talented. Every artist gets typecast. Oh yes, aggressively so. Tar seems not to take into consideration that sexism might play a part in why people feel like they don't like her. And when the interviewer asks her directly about sexism in classical music, well, do you think there'll be a moment, though, when the classical music community uh, decides not to use uh, sexual distinctions to differentiate artists? She does something that we'll see her do over and over in the film. She deflects and redirects to a question that she wants to answer, because Tar is conducting this interview. I'm probably the wrong person to ask since I don't uh, read reviews. Never, really. No. Pausing here just to know that this is one of many, many lies Lydia Tarr has constructed about herself in order to achieve this persona of a great man in our time. Later in the film, we see Tarr jog up to a magazine stand where the owner is already waiting to give her a copy of her review. She later places it safely away with all the other reviews she definitely, definitely didn't read. But back to sexism. But it is odd, uh, I think, that anyone ever felt compelled to substitute maestro with maestra. I mean, we don't call uh, women astronauts, astronets. No, we don't call female astronauts, astronets. But Kate Blanchett, herself a titan of our time, is nominated for Best Actress, not Best Actor. And anyways, NASA is currently moving to change the designation of manned or unmanned flights as an official term in favor of crewed or uncrewed because it was gendered. And that's besides all the other systematic barriers that women astronauts have to face. So yes, Tar, you are correct. We don't say astronauts because we have much subtler ways to ruin women's careers. Isn't that right, Lydia? I'm a firm believer in pulling up the ladder behind me. But as to the question of uh, gender bias, I really have nothing to complain about. Nor, for that matter, should Marin Alsop, Joanne Folletta, uh, Laurence Elcubey, uh, Natalie Stutzman. Conducting is often looked to as having one of the most abysmal gender gaps of any creative field. And all of the women Tar mentioned have complained. Very loudly. And rightfully so. There are many, many barriers for entry for women conductors. Boards who make decisions are overwhelmingly white 
male and old. According to Cynthia Woods, a prominent female conductor, many conservatories still won't even accept women into their programs. Sometimes they'll say it to your face. It's a personal relationship and I'm just not comfortable teaching a woman. The industry says, well, they're not qualified, but this is a job where you learn on the job and so much of what you learn comes from experience. So if we never give women the experience, we'll never catch up with the men. They will always be underqualified. But Lydia knows this. Of course she does. Even more than playing instruments, the thing Lydia is best at playing is the patriarchy. We see this happening in the film. As her current affair with her assistant fizzles, she starts pursuing a young cellist, while her long-term partner watches powerless from the sidelines. And amid all of that, her former protege and ex-lover has a mental health crisis that ends tragically after Lydia has sabotaged her career. Lydia gets dinner with her mentor. She tells him, I'd never have the position here were it not for you. And later, when her many affairs and scandals are brought to light, her mentor implies that he's guilty of the exact same behavior. Have you ever had an issue with a, a student or colleague where that person may have misinterpreted your has intention. someone been complaining about no, me? No, 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 of course not. Because at this point, they missed that chance. Lydia owes her entire career to a man who chased countless women just like Lydia away from the profession. But he sees himself and the men like him as the real victims. Thank God I was never pulled from the podium like Jimmy Levine. The New York Times reporting three men have come forward accusing Levine of sexually abusing them decades ago. Or hunted like Charles Dutrois. Three opera singers and a classical musician say Charles Dutois abused them. And perpetuating the same modes of patriarchy, Lydia went on to do the same. By casting a woman in what was initially a male role, the film frees us from the conventional associations we'd have with a male perpetrator, giving us a fresh perspective on power and corruption. Ta draws many parallels between conducting and directing, and it's hard not to see the comparison here, and specifically about the gender dynamics of these two art forms. I recently worked on a video about Stephanie Rothman, a prominent and commercially successful director during the 70s, who was pushed out of the industry through blatant and rampant misogyny. It took 50 years for the Oscars to nominate a woman for best director, and only seven women since have had that honor. And this time around, there are no women nominated. Not even Sarah Pauly for her phenomenal women talking. But of course, ironically, Todd Field is nominated for Best Director for this very movie about this very issue. No shade to Todd, he absolutely deserved it. I just think Sarah did too. I mean, there's so many incredible women who came before us. You know, women who did the, the real lifting. Th that's fascinating. Uh, can you, who for instance? Miss, for a dollar, name a woman. Name a woman? Yeah. Um. Uh, okay, sure. Uh. And when she answers the question, she can't help but give a backhanded compliment to the women who came before her. You know, at, I mean, at that time, it was, it was all gender spectacle. But fortunately, times change, and I mean, the Pauline conversion is, Pauline. if not complete, then it's, it's, it's evolving nicely. No. The Pauline conversion is any life-changing event in which one's views are significantly altered. And it comes from a story in the New Testament about the Apostle Paul going from persecuting early Christians to becoming one after seeing a figure of the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Or he had a seizure, if you're asking a neurologist. Tara's saying here that she's happy with the speed with which equality is coming about. And after just having talked about the reality of being a female conductor, Woof. But there's also something sinister about comparing a civil rights movement to a biblical story about divine intervention. While I'm sure there are some people that arrive at a feminist or anti-racist perspective by some large event in their life, for the vast, vast majority of people, it is just a long, slow slog of purposeful unlearning. Unlearning the rules of patriarchy and hierarchical control, of colonialism, of gender essentialism, and on and on and on. In other words, true change usually takes a lot of time. Later in the film, Tara's presented with her own potential Pauline conversion when she discovers the fate of her former protege and she blows right past it as if it didn't even happen. Now we have to forget about her. 
just like Paul. She sees visions of the undead haunting her throughout the film. but it doesn't change her at all. Just like Paul, Tar was a piece of shit before. You are a robot. And a piece of shit afterwards. Time, 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 time. Tar is the human metronome against which everyone else must measure their lives. Could we talk a little bit about uh, translation? Because mm -hmm. I think there are still people who think of the conductor as a kind of human metronome. Well, yeah, that's 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 partly true. Yeah, but but the end of keeping time, it's 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 no small thing. Tar interrupts here because, in case we forgot, she is the one conducting this interview. Time is the thing. Uh -huh. Time is is the essential piece of uh, interpretation. See, I start the clock. Now this is where we get to the horror of it all. However, unlike a clock, sometimes my second hand stops which means that time stops. Tar and the people like Lydia Tar have the ability to stop time. Tar is the keeper of time as one of the most important musical figures of our time, who has enough power in her circle to move society forwards or backwards. Lydia needs to feel in control. Whenever another person is conducting or even making the motions of conducting, like tapping their fingers or clicking a pen, or nervously bouncing their knee, she stops them. Even when other people are talking, she's the one keeping time. Kaplan Fund is gonna buy some radio outdoor advertising. In another scene, we watch Lydia teaching a classroom of young conductors. She clashes with a student who is less than thrilled with the work of dead white men. Honestly, as a BIPOC, pangender person, I would say box misogynistic life makes it kind of impossible for me to take his music seriously. And of course, she does not take this well. She uses the student as an example to the rest of the class, that we cannot criticize people for who they are or what they do, that we must separate the art from the artist, that their personal life or beliefs don't reflect in their work. In this classroom, Lydia controls the time that these students are living in. Throughout this scene, we get subtle hints that She's not actually familiar with the piece of music that the student chose to conduct. It's new, so she hasn't had time to master it. <sighs> it's exciting to play new music, isn't it? And since she can't show authority over the piece, she exerts her authority over the students. This scene runs over 10 minutes, the longest scene in the entire film. And it is 10 full minutes of Tar bluffing her way through class, wasting all of these students' time, simply because she can't stand not being in complete control. And in this way, she's able to suspend progress. Where are you going? You fucking bitch. The other way that time is controlled by the affluent, especially those in the arts, is how much time they're able to dedicate to their craft. When Tar is trying to write a new piece, we see her tinkering on the piano. But then we see her making tea, getting frustrated. Fast forward to later in the film, and she's hardly gotten any more work done on the song. While Tar is trying to write her masterpiece, she keeps getting interrupted by two notes. It's exactly like that kid's teasing chant that uh, we examined for its universality in our first lecture. Remember, nya, 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 nya. Lydia is being mocked by her inability to create. She can control other people's time, but she can't control her own. Later in the film, we find out that the notes are an alert. Coming from her next door neighbor, who's fallen out of her chair. Sie muss da rauf! Sie muss da rauf! While Lydia has more time than she knows what to do with, her neighbor is running out of it. It's not an accident that many in the creative field come from cushy backgrounds or nepotism. There's only so much time you can dedicate to your passions if you need to work a regular job to stay alive. And no amount of inspirational quotes can give you extra hours in the day to work on it. Executives read books like The 4-Hour Workweek, while everyone else is told to just go get a third or fourth job. Lydia Tarr manipulates time to manipulate everyone around her. And while that's kind of an abstract concept, 
powerful people have manipulated time since the early days of civilization. In his book called About Time, David Rooney discusses various clocks throughout history, which were used by the ruling class to impose order on those beneath them. From the way that precise timekeeping was key to the British Navy's ability to conquer the Earth, to medieval clocks that charted the movement of the planets, and by extension, God and the Church's command over them, to the sundials of the early Roman days. He quotes a character in a play by Plautus. The gods damn the man who first discovered the hours. And yes, who first set up a sundial here? Who smashed the day into bits for poor me? You know, when I was a boy, my stomach was the only sundial. By far the best and truest compared to all of these. It used to warn me to eat. But now what there is isn't eaten unless the sun says so. Throughout history, clocks and timekeeping have symbolized the external control of the powerful and their authority over the very concept of time, and especially how those beneath them were supposed to use it. Tar's neighbor eventually does pass away, and when her family politely asks Lydia what time she prefers to practice because they're trying to show the apartment to potential buyers, she does not take it well. Lydia Tarr creates time. She starts it. She molds it. And she will not change her tune or time for anyone else. Time. 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 It's time. Tarr needs to feel in control of the people around her. But the reality is no one, not even Lydia Tarr, can have complete control of the events that happen to them. So much of the film's plot is her past choices catching up with her in the present. Tarr doesn't know the end of the film. She doesn't know where she will end up in about three hours of our time. After having a very public outburst, <laughs> it's my scar! Lydia winds up in what is presumably the Philippines, though I want to make a note that my Filipino director friend, Quark, was very thrown by the ending because it was very clearly not the Philippines, according to him. They did make attempts to make it feel like the Philippines, like the main speaking character was Filipino, and they even put this hit song by Sarah Geronimo playing in the background. And I saw a poster of Jose Rizal, our national hero, in the background. But once the other characters spoke, it was super clear it was in Thailand. Hee 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 hee. And we see her conducting a live event of video game music. But here, in the now, she's cocky. Because she never saw that future for herself coming. Back in the interview scene, they discuss the ways that interpretations change over time, something that's relevant right now, in our time, with all of these originalists on the Supreme Court. But I'm sure I'm just reading that into the film. Kavanaugh. Yeah, it's, it's the Hebrew word for attention to meaning or, or intent. You know, what are the composer's priorities and what are yours and how do they complement one another? Oh, oh, okay. Right, Kavanaugh. I think that's a word that will have slightly different meaning for many in our audience. Well, yes, yes, I imagine so. Time is the essential piece of interpretation. The name Kavanaugh means something very different to this modern audience, just as art can be interpreted very differently depending on the time that we are living in. Like, say, how a young pan-gender conductor might not want to play a song by Bach. And of course, she ignores that the word Kavanaugh also refers to the concept of seeking atonement for past sins. Am I right in thinking that conductor was not always uh, an onstage presence in classical no, that's music? Right. I, I think I read someplace that it actually was the first violin for a long time. Who yes, was the first violinist. Interrupting as many times as she can, Lydia tells the legend of the first conductor, a French composer, Jean-Baptiste Louis, who died of gangrene because he stabbed himself in the foot while banging his long conducting staff. He died keeping time. Uh, but really, he died because he refused to cut off his infected leg because he wanted to keep dancing at the lavish parties around him. Tar also stabs her career in the foot because she too doesn't want to stop herself from reaping the benefits of her position. The way in which conducting evolved into what it is today is remarkably similar to the way that the profession of directing came about, as plays became more complicated and started to incorporate cutting edge technology, like lights. So did the need for someone to oversee the bird's eye view to coordinate all of the moving elements. And the legend of the first director, was a woman named Madame Vitry at the Olympic Theater in 1830. Before she took on the role of director and theater producer, she was most known for being an actress who, 
cross-dressed on stage, playing the parts of men in famous operas and burlesque shows of the time. Both Jean-Baptiste Louis and Madame Vitry were condemned by their more conservative critics at the time. Jean-Baptiste for being openly homosexual, and Madame Vitry for rebuffing traditional gender roles. Their identities informed their life experiences and the challenges that they faced. But I'm sure Lydia would say that they had nothing to complain about. The way Tara manipulates stories, by leaving out information or emphasizing only what she wants you to hear, makes her kind of a verbal magician. Tara is dressed and gesticulates like a magician. She even speaks of conducting as a kind of illusion. The illusion is that, like you, I'm responding to the orchestra in real right. time, making right. the decision about the right moment to restart the thing or reset it or throw time out the window altogether. Throughout the film, we see her entire persona and success is also an illusion, carefully crafted with sleight of hand and misdirection. The reality is, that right from the very beginning, I know precisely what time really? it is and the exact moment that you and I will arrive at our destination together. Wait a minute. Magician? Musician? Magician? Musician? Speaking about the way that Beethoven started his Fifth Symphony, Tar makes innovation and progress seem so brave and brilliant and obvious. The nope. downbeat, uh -huh. bop, 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 it's silent, right? So someone had to start that clock. Someone had to uh, plant their flag in the sand and say, follow me. But when that student from class challenges her and plants their flag in the sand, she refuses to follow. But back to Lydia conducting Mahler's fifth. With this one, it really is about trying to read the tea leaves of, of Mahler's intention. Here, Lydia is saying that staying true to Mahler's intention is the key to an accurate interpretation of his work that his life and the time that he lived in matter. But in class, when Bach's sordid history is brought up, she argues that we should revere him for his work alone, that an author's intention has no bearing on their work, that a conductor should be separate from their personal failings, to view their art only through a vacuum. What is it, Lydia? Are we supposed to care about an author's original interpretation or their personal life? Or are we supposed to base our opinions on the skill and craft alone? So if you're going to partner with Mahler on his uh, fifth symphony, the first thing you must do is try to understand that very complex marriage. I'm unclear as to what his prodigious skills in the marital bed have to do with B minor. The answer is, it's just whatever's more beneficial to her in the moment. So after all of this talk of interpretation and history and intent, let's go back to when Tar said, very complex marriage. Well, let's just fast forward and see what extremely complex concept she ends up going for in her interpretation of Mahler's fifth. And so you chose love. Air horn! The very thing that, over the next two and a half hours, we'll learn that Lydia knows nothing about. And would you say that you have a different interpretation of that marriage than Bernstein did? She takes her sweet time to answer, because she is conducting this interview. Well, Adam, the Shapibo Kanibo only receive an Ikaro or song if the singer is there. Look, I'm not an expert on the Shapibo Kanibo peoples, but I don't think Lydia is either. I'm not an expert because I have not studied under them, and she's not an expert because she didn't listen to them. According to my very limited understanding of their teachings, what she says about them isn't entirely accurate. Firstly, the shaman of the tribes receive the songs from nature itself. They don't conduct, they listen. They listen to the rainforest around them, consume the plants, and in turn, the plants and animals gift them the music. Lydia is projecting her Western idea of a conductor onto the shaman. Also, the Shabibo Kanibal do write down their songs. In fact, they have a very unique and beautiful way to do just that through art. Specifically, this art. These intricate repeating patterns are songs of the Shibibo Kanibo tribe. Each song is entirely unique, and many of them are songs of healing. The patterns that haunt Lydia are songs. Songs of healing that she is not listening to. And the pandemic, which Tar gets to think of as a minor inconvenience for her concert scheduling, was extremely devastating to the Shibibo Kanibo people. So she misinterprets the people that she supposedly learned from, and next goes on to misinterpret her supposed idol, Leonard Bernstein. 
But Lenny, he believed in Teshuvah, the, the Talmudic power to reach back into time and, and transform the uh, significance of one's past deeds. He believed in time being the essential piece of interpretation. So when he played the Adagetto at Robert Kennedy's funeral, it ran for 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. He treated it, it really, as a mass. Yeah, right. And uh, you know, if you listen to a recording of it, you will no doubt feel the tragedy and, and, and the pathos. Okay, yeah, sure, it's like beautiful or whatever, but it's not what Muller intended. Bernstein played a song written in the past while bringing in the present circumstances and emotion. Tar feels that it's her job to recreate Muller. But Bernstein knows that a true artist brings their own lens to every piece. If you'll notice, we don't actually see Tar doing much creative thinking on her own. She uses other conductors' outfits. She plays other people's music. The only time we see her trying to create, she's stuck listening to the mocking tones of While teaching her master class during the debate about Bach, Tar argues that the conductor must have a fully formed, concrete idea about what that original composer was trying to say with the piece. My prayer for you is that you will be spared the embarrassment of standing on the podium with a 433 trying to sell a car without an engine. Now is the time to conduct music that actually requires something of you. You know, music that everybody knows but will hear differently when you interpret it for them. What is 433? First performed in 1952, the piece is a unique score composed by John Cage that simply instructs the performers not to play their instruments. Sometimes 433 involves a pianist walking up to a piano, closing it, and sitting there. Sometimes it involves an entire orchestra, with the conductor standing and gesturing at the players as they sit there almost motionless. Like this performance by the Berlin Philharmonic, the same orchestra that Tarr conducts in the film. Sometimes it involves Adam Neely and samurai guitarist sitting on stage holding their instruments as a phone timer counts down. 4.33 has got to be the weirdest piece to discuss while talking about concrete meaning and authorial intent. Cage wanted to question what music is and explore the idea that literally any sound can be considered music. That music is always all around us, if we're willing to listen. Speaking about the premiere of 433, Cage said, they missed the point. There's no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence, because they didn't know how to listen, was full of accidental sounds. You could hear the wind stirring outside during the first movement. During the second, raindrops began pattering the roof. And during the third, the people themselves were making all kinds of interesting sounds as they talked or walked out. Everyone's presence becomes part of the unique performance of 433. A cough, a sniff, a scratch. It challenges the hierarchy of musical performance because we all become part of the song. A song with no conductor, no predetermined destination that we will all arrive at together. The Shabibo Knibo people also received their music from the sounds around them. In their song that begins the film, we hear the music of the forest, and all of it adds to the beauty of the piece. Lydia Tarr is a conductor who wants absolute authority over every aspect of a performance, and she invokes 433, a piece that questions her very authority as a conductor, in order to assert that authority over a student who is simply trying to plant a flag and say, follow me. All right, whatever. That's, that's your choice. 433 asks us to listen, and Tarr refuses to. If Lydia were conscious of her surroundings, she would have noticed the student very obviously filming her master class. She can't even listen to the hums and dings around her home. Instead, she hunts them down to stop them. And right now, you're watching a video on the internet. A medium so artificial that creators are expected to edit out every little bit of silence to the point of absurdity.
When we record, we have to pause for traffic, uh, airplanes, my downstairs neighbors, uh, because they play the accordion quite often. And then we cut out all these silences. That aren't really silent. A lot of my videos are about giving social or historical context about a particular movie, to set it within a specific time and place, to peel back layers and find deeper meaning, which takes time. For any giving video that's 30 minutes, you can assume that I've spent a month, if not more, working on it. It may seem tightly constructed when you watch it, but for me, it's hours and days and weeks of work and writing and rewriting and my makeup takes a hot minute to do. And even though the movie's less than three hours long, I have been thinking about it for months. As a society of consumers, we're very focused on the end product. It's easy for us to forget all of the labor and the listening that goes into creating. That's one thing that I love about this film. From putting the credits at the beginning to showing the many, many people whose labor goes into the creation of the product known as Lydia Tarr. She has so much power that she's able to edit out all of the people beneath her, helping to create an illusion of complete control, even destroying their careers just to further her time in the spotlight. But the one thing that she can't escape is time. Her past catches up with her. Her actions come back to haunt her. And eventually, we all run out of time. Speaking of giving social and historical context, sometimes that context is, how should I put this? More adult. Which the powers that be don't allow on this platform. So when I wanted to make a series about the history of gender, sex, and sexuality in film, I couldn't really do it on YouTube. Not only would I get demonetized, but it could get straight up delisted where the video doesn't even show up in the search results, like some of the videos that I've published here in the past. Naughty girl. But I am making that series. It's called Unrated, and you can watch the first episode right now, uncensored, over on Nebula. Did you know that Wings, the first film to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, features a kiss between two men at its climax? But that's just the beginning of unraveling the fascinating gender politics of this early American classic. I also explore Ecstasy, the first film to feature a female <coughs> orgasm <coughs> on film, and the pioneering work of Oscar Micheaux, considered the first black American to direct a feature film whose stories challenge the white supremacist narratives of Hollywood. Episode two, premiering in March, is gonna be on the films of British director David Lean, who used subtext to sneak LGBT plus coded stories past the censors. I'm finishing up editing this video right now, and I honestly think it's one of the best videos I've ever made. And I couldn't have done any of this if it weren't for Nebula, the creator-owned platform where you'll find shows and movies that you can't watch anywhere else. Like Abigail Thorne's feature-length production of her groundbreaking play, The Prince. Or Polyphonic's amazing visual magazine that covers some of the most exciting musicians working today. Or Princess Weeks' Anime Court, dissecting some of the hot topics in anime without a toxic comment section. Sign up for Nebula using my link that's on the screen right now, and you'll get a discount at checkout, meaning that you'll only pay $2.50 a month. That's go.nebula.tv slash Maggie Mae Fish. Using this link is a great way to support an independent creator like myself. And I really appreciate it. And if you sign up with my link, you also get free access to Nebula classes, where our creators host classes on how to be, uh, well, a creator. All the classes are taught by folks here on Nebula, so you can learn how the Friday Checkout makes a video, or how Foreign tells stories, or how Patrick Willems makes movies. It's your favorite creators teaching you how they create. It's great for anyone who wants to learn how to make video essays, or if you just want a peek behind the curtain. So strap on, lube up, and head over to Nebula to check out the first episode of Unrated. Thank you so much for watching. A big round of applause to all of my patrons, plus everyone watching over on Nebula. If you liked the video, be sure to like the video, double check that you're subscribed to the channel, and leave a comment. If you wanna help me make more videos, get access to my Discord, and see my YouTube videos before anyone else, check out my Patreon over at patreon.com slash Maggie Mayfish. And 
hey, if you're looking for something else to watch here on YouTube, might I suggest my feature-length video comparing Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker and Marvel's Loki. Trust me, you're gonna love it. Until next time, listen to Martha. Thank you.